clear sense of timing. Because of the UCU strike, colleagues in London have organized teach-outs. And, and it just so happened, 4 o'clock today at UCO was a good time for them to be checking on this. On a different topic, of course. And uh, thanks for the return engagement. Because I think when I gave a talk here about two years ago, that was on sustainable intensification. And that was while I was refining a draft article, which was going to appear in a book, which it has since done. And the discussion com comments here were very useful for sharpening my argument. In this case, the paper is already published, so I'll, but the research will continue on this theme. So as Michelle mentioned, this comes from my research partnership with people at UNESPI, Universidade Estadual Paulista. We did a pilot study about two years ago of particular sites of agroecological production. And that eventually led to this paper, which was published a couple months ago in the Journal of Peasant Studies, same title. And the details are on the publicity for this event. And then we did a second set of site visits last April. And that led to, or strengthened, our proposal for a research project, which succeeded. That is now started. That's called Agroecology based solidarity economy in Bolivia and Brazil, including their partner in Bolivia in the overall project. So this uh, partnership and the theme will continue. So comments are welcome from that standpoint. So next, who, who controls the... I forgot to ask where the control is. Oh, right. Here we are. Here we are. OK. <coughs> so as people here will well know over many years, you know, agroecology has been highlighted, promoted, and expanded worldwide, especially being counterposed to the Green Revolution model of capital-intensive inputs, technology packages, the diffusionist model where expertise flows from laboratories or agronomists to farmers. And Brazil, in particular, has instructive experiences from its widespread land conflicts, its agroecological alternatives to that dominant model, and support measures for them from both government and NGOs, well, also foundations. And Brazil's agroecological practices highlight three global tendencies. First, agroecology as a counter-hegemonic agenda. Second, agroecological production seeking new market niches within a capitalist logic. And third, related, agroecological techniques being selectively adapted for greening the conventional agri-food system. That may sound like a contradiction in terms, because people might say, that's not really agroecology. But you'll see as the plot thickens that it's not so simple about what is or isn't agroecology. Now, practitioners recognize this difficulty with agroecology being appropriated for agendas different than or antagonistic to their aims. So they've adopted the term territorial development as a strategic concept for clarifying how agroecology should be developed as an alternative to or even opposition to the dominant model. Oh, I've gone backwards instead of forwards. No, no, forward. Okay. Oh, I'll just swipe it. Swipe it. Oh, swipe it that way. Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, anyway. Learning a new skill here. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the term appears in strategy documents that come from the FAO's agroecology program, which began 
the big conference in 2014, attended by some people here, of course. And then regional conferences, including ones in Latin America, which generated important analyses, especially public policies in favor of agroecology in Latin America, where the term territorial development is elaborated. And that takes up the term, which was already being used by various social movements and academics throughout Latin America in particular. A key term is strategic reading of territory. I'll explain. There's a general agenda by the advocates to increase the scale of agroecology. This is also called scaling, escalamiento, or massifying, or territorializing agroecology. Now, scaling has two complementary forms, which were set out two decades ago in publications in Spanish. First, horizontal, also called scaling out, meaning multiplying initiatives or examples by adapting them to different contexts. And second, vertical, also called scaling up, meaning strengthening institutional support measures for the, the horizontal scaling. So these two are complementary, but also potentially in conflict, depending on the form of those support measures, especially if they end up perpetuating like the diffusionist model. So from the standpoint of the social movements, the objective is to contest, contest and transform the dominant agenda, the dominant agro-food system, rather than to green it. But what does this mean in practice? Some NGOs facilitate a participatory process, which they call a strategic reading of territory by communities especially to identify opportunities and obstacles for scaling agroecology. The conflicts arise over the meaning of both terms, territory and agroecology, especially in relation to different development models. So in our paper, we adopt the term agroecological practices in the broadest sense of any practices which appropriate agroecological methods, meaning based on agroecosystems of some kind, regardless of the purpose, as you will see. And we relate these to territorial development trajectories. Hence our research questions. Agroecology practitioners have been discussing how to gain, strengthen, and use territorial support measures from state bodies for tr their transformative aims. For example, the FAO conference held in 2018 posed the question how to take agroecology to scale through integrated and participatory territorial processes. Now, I'll read out a, an excerpt from the chair's summary, which I think is accurate, describing the ambiguities of that phrase. So it says, Supporting territorial approaches and planning for agroecology that protects the rights of local communities to land and that integrate across sectors and reconnect the urban and rural by involving all local actors in an integrative, participatory, and inclusive way. The chair's summary also mentioned the need for conflict management around those processes, though any conflict remained vague in that document. So what are the conflicts? What are the divergent agendas around territorial development? How have agroecological practices been appropriated for specific trajectories of territorial development, perhaps divergent and conflictual ones? What are the power relations involved? What are the implications for an agroecology agenda to transform the hegemonic agri-food system? So those are the key questions underlying our analysis. <clears throat> so the broader context, social movements and NGOs together, you know, with 
with practitioners, with peasant movements, have emphasized the link between peasant agriculture, also called agroecology by default, with a means to overcome climate change and to promote food sovereignty. So here, the La Via Campesina, the global movement encompassing all you know, small-scale peasant and indigenous organizations, had raised the slogan, sustainable peasants' agriculture cools down the earth, you know, by contrast with the Green Revolution model, which heats up the planet. And then the slogan, WTO, out of agriculture, for food sovereignty, because the WTO you know, promotes the concept of food security in the neoliberal sense of the word, you know, whereby capital-intensive inputs increase production and supposedly provide security for everyone. Now let's move on to the meanings of territory. And, and that disputed meanings of agroecology, too. I mean, as other writers have pointed out, agroecology has been disputed materially, is agroecology as framing, as farming, and immaterial, agroecology as framing. It is different ways of framing the, the problems and solutions as a way to mobilize practitioners for transformative agendas. Agroecology has been situated in context of territorial development. And the key concept in the literature in Latin America is desenvolvimento or desarrollo, Spanish, Portuguese, territorial rural, which I'll henceforth call DTR. This has contested versions. Now, first I present what I call the social consensual version. Not that it is consensual, but it, it normatively projects a social consensus as the basis for DTR. So the dominant version has meant to encompass and conciliate all relevant actors in a territory. It says, this is according to the leading writers, who, whose writings, I think, influence the chair summary that I quoted before about You'll see the, the similarity. Though I didn't realize that till I looked up the, the horse's mouth here. The institutions linking all actors are indispensable so that development processes can um, overcome the power relations that exclude poor sectors, meaning poor populations, from the opportunities and benefits of development. Now, these authors criticize some approaches for overemphasizing socially marginalized groups while ignoring other territorial actors such as merchants, bureaucracies, and industry. Consequently, they say, some coalitions supporting DTR have a narrow social base which reduces its power and potentials. So this implies that poverty reduction depends on all relevant actors sharing a common agenda. This social consensual version complements the policy frameworks of major institutions, such as the Inter-American Bank for Development, and likewise, Brazil's Ministry for Agrarian Development, which has generally promoted the diffusionist model of the Green Revolution. Now, I'll move to what I call the antagonistic version. This consensual version attracts several critiques. It obscures the class contradictions that generates societal conflict, especially how capital accumulation excludes or exploits poor people. Through territorial development, the dominant agents seek to maintain their power, while subaltern groups seek to resist <coughs> and overcome that power. Agribusiness and family agriculture undergo conflicts over development, generating, quote, territorialization and deterritorialization processes thus transforming the actors in the process. And territorialization, according to um, Bernardo Manzano Fernandez, means that agribusiness or other capital accumulation processes appropriate land and resources and thereby dispossess or deterritorialize 
the people who lived there and depended on those resources. And then now, he adds a concept, territorialized movements as distinct from agribusiness territorializing. These movements are a response to re-territorialize a space. They are organized and act in different places at the same time, made possible by their form of organization, which permits the spatialization of the struggle for land. And this is a way to theorize, in particular, the MST, the Landless Movement, which I'll explain later, as a model for multiplying and expanding this counter-hegemonic agenda. Now, how to operationalize the concept territorial development for empirical analysis, I didn't see anything in the literature. So during our first visit, we brainstormed and developed the analytical schema of four parameters and then started to apply it more and more to the case studies just during that week. And it resulted in this table, which is from the paper in Journal of Peasant Studies. I won't try to you know, explain it in detail because it would take too much time. But, but as I go through each case study, you'll see connections, although not in the same order. Now, our paper selects just some of the case studies that we did, three which are agroforestry, and then become all the more interesting for, for comparing, contrasting the forms of agroforestry. All three initiatives promote themselves as showcases for environmentally sustainable methods, which could and should be widely adopted. And that's partly why there's so much on their websites. There is so much written about them, even films on YouTube, and why they took the time to give us you know, a day-long tour and an explanation of their practices. So the first one, <clears throat> I'll treat this a little more briefly than the others to save time. The first one is Fazenda da Toca, whose director really didn't come from agriculture at all, but he got the idea from all these developments towards agroecology that of converting what had been a monoculture plantation into agroforestry, and did so in ways I'll explain in a bit. And it, it advertises its products you know, as healthy products, especially drinks. They do mainly fruit production and sell these fruits to the main retailers and, and processors in the state of Sao Paulo, who then convert it into juice drinks, which can be preserved more easily than <coughs> fruit. And thereby, this reinforces the dominant supply chains, which serve agribusiness in general. The products are certified organic through the conventional system of third party certification which is administratively burdensome and expensive. But it, it means that people on that plantation <coughs> don't need to be involved in, in the certification, don't need to know the details. They do have a um, division of labor between professional staff, who use the canteen where we were hosted for lunch, and the, the manual workers in far greater numbers who we saw all around the plantation eating their lunch at the side of the road, as they, as they might do on a mini plantation. Now, through an internet search, I eventually came across something which revealed that this was much uh, was part of a much bigger picture. A project. <clears throat> yeah, that's, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's the Toka. Oh, no. <coughs> yeah, 
that's the, I forgot to show this, Toka Organica is the label. Verena means economic valorization of reforestation with native species. <laughs> this was a project in, in featuring a workshop, including representatives from the major agribusiness companies, the nature conservation organizations, like Conservation International, and a wide range of experts to evaluate the different options for how a reforestation project, with its enormous expense in materials and labor, could obtain a return on investment within an appropriate time scale. And this gives you some idea of what they were considering, you know, how, to, how the primary native forest might be adapted for creating anew a forest, an agroforestry system where nothing of the sort had existed recently because it had been destroyed by the, the monoculture plantation. And this led to the conclusion that the only viable financial model would be exactly what they did, that is just to sell most of the products to food processing companies just for the rapid turnover of the, the products and thereby the, the cash flow. And implicitly, it, I think it led to the division of labor as well, as well as a, a plan for a mechanization in order eventually to reduce the dependence <coughs> on the manual laborers. So they, they specially designed machinery for that purpose. Different than you would find on a, on a monoculture plantation, because it has to deal with the forest, agroforestry conditions. And here you see just some of the manual laborers dealing with the banana trees, illustrating the conventional division of labor. So I'll, I'll, I won't continue on that one, because I want to spend a little more time on the, the other two case studies. So the second one, a sentimento Mario Lago, <clears throat> just outside the major city of Rivero, Creto. This settlement was founded by the, or led by the MST, Movimento de Trabalhadores Rurais Santero, the landless movement, within the big wave of land occupations, which in this case you know, obtained tenure to the land through the Agraria Reforma, Reforma Agraria, Agraria Reform Program. But initially, they faced many difficulties which they began to overcome, and where's I'll explain. When MST settlements began, they knew the Green Revolution model, and some of them you know, tried to imitate that model with harmful effects, obviously. And then they looked for an alternative, and around the turn of the century, they began to experiment with agroecological methods, and in some cases, creating agroforestry where nothing like that existed before, just like a, in Fazenda de Toca, except the social basis is entirely different for, for the MST settlements. This is in a hostile political economic context because the public authorities promote foreign investment in agribusiness in the whole area you know, on the basis of the Green Revolution model, bringing in a lucrative return on investment. But the settlement turned that to their advantage by gaining a contract with assistance for a, what's called a sustainable development project on the basis that it would use no agrochemicals and develop agroforestry 
in, in ways that would restore the natural resources, and in particular, the aquifer on which the city depends for its water supply. So that arrangement complemented their decision anyway to move towards agroforestry. <coughs> But they still faced problems because many people were dependent on wage labor in the city for a basic income. And they were wondering how would they sustain the next generation? Be children, and how do we keep them on the settlement and create a collective commitment? And the initial income, you know, apart from these grants, came from these, the state public uh, procurement program for food, which had been established long before by the, the Workers' Party government. There's one program for consolidating the products of small-scale producers, and there's another related program for selling those products, you know, consolidated, to the state authorities, especially for school meals. You'll see the abbreviations on the handout. So this provided the first significant regular income to the cooperative members who were supplying that food. But, you know, as academic writers have pointed out, these programs impose great administrative requirements. And those requirements began to dominate the meetings of the cooperatives to the point where only about one-tenth of the members were attending the meetings. And it, it ended up inducing a hierarchical form of organization in practice, despite the commitment to a horizontal process. So they needed some alternative to this. And they eventually found it by creating a box scheme of you know, similar products, which would now be supplied in a community-supported agriculture project. That is where people pay subscriptions. And there were many willing subscribers who wanted, in the city who wanted to support this. So here's the van which delivers those weekly Sestish agroforestaish, agroforestry baskets. And uh, by coincidence, well, maybe it wasn't by coincidence. On the day we were there, it was the weekly pickup. So we saw them assembling the baskets from the various kinds of products and putting it into the lumber. Which are, and you can see that, the, well, the logos indicate the, the clever strategy of bringing together the startup funds from all these institutions, the state programs, uh, even the World Bank. So they had the skills. They had already developed the collective capacities to identify and use all those opportunities for support measures just to start this scheme. And that began to transform the social organization, because now the cooperatives were discussing how to design this scheme, so I think step by step. So obviously, the cultivation doesn't use agrochemicals. But then what does it use? What, what agroforestry methods? And then Pregal is a humorous analogy to a, a trading floor negotiation of people buying and selling products. But they, they adapt it in a uh, cooperative sense <coughs> of, of a group discussion about how to plan the food baskets, how to price them in a way that gives them a fair income, but makes it still affordable to the subscribers. And then the montage and the assembly, again, kind of industrial metaphor, assembly of the baskets, the contents, and then the distribution, which eventually went far beyond the subscribers to stalls around the city. So this also gave a more stable income and a higher income to the producers than just relying on the public procurement program. 
Now move on to the agroforestry aspect. They got much assistance from a national program called Projeto Agroforestar. And again, this relates to the whole institutional context of Brazil, you know, including the Workers' Party government and the uh, Petrobras. I mean, it's, it's one of the few state oil companies which you know, continue. And apart from all the damage done by oil, <laughs> They have a legislative mandate to spend a small percentage of their budget on socio-environmental projects, which include this Projeto Aris Florestar. And they got staff members you know, who really knew about agroforestry, understood the aims of these alternative uh, agendas and the, and the the settlements, and they have the slogan, you know, why? Because <coughs> the earth doesn't belong to us, we belong to the earth. And of course, that slogan comes from indigenous groups. So, and it indicates how people who had, knew nothing about agroforestry before begin to understand and adopt elements of indigenous culture. So, but as regards the diffusionist model, which I mentioned before, I mean, this is always a potential problem, regardless of the best intentions from the external ex experts, say from this project or from the extension services. So the MST settlements, especially this one, realized they have to develop their own internal expertise by going on training courses, which they did, you know, partly by attending events in Fazenda de Toca. And you know, other training events, so that they would have the internal expertise to make their own judgments about how to appropriate or adapt the external expertise for improving their agroforestry. You know, including the machinery, which had been designed by Fazenda de Toca to exploit labor, but, but it seems you know, adaptable for their purposes here in what they call, you know, now, technologia social or technologia social in case, uh, socio environmental technologies. And I'll, I'll explain more about that for, for the next case study. So, we'll go on to that. Oh, and, and, sorry, the, uh, yeah, and the project that I have for our star aims in particular to spread good practices across the settlements. Mm -hmm through members of the settlements visiting each other. So that will come up again here. Uh, this is just the final slide for the Sentimento Mario Lago. And it just indicates there what you might call an outreach program. The Manual de Sobrevivencia para el Secolo Survival Manual for the 21st Century is a film series which is being screened at various venues around the country. And this one element of that is um, about agroforestry production. So it's a public event held at a major cultural center in the city as a way of spreading their message and gaining more support for their alternative agenda. All right, now we go on to the, the third case study. <coughs> The Forum de Comunidades Tradicionais, which is located in a few towns on the Costa Verde, the Green Coast, which is part of the much bigger Litoral Norte, the, the, the northern part of the coast, which extends really eastward to, no, um, to Rio de Janeiro. So it's in between Sao Paulo and that city. If you look at the logo, you can see it represents the three main communities, the Quilombos, descendants of the escaped slaves, the indigenous, same word, and Caisares, which is an, an old term uh, referring to those who farm or fish and many descendants from the European settlers from a long time ago. And they were potential 
uh, tensions among those communities for the use of the space in these areas. And then there were worse potential conflicts with real estate development for you know, intensive tourism and for second homes, each in their own way, potentially territorializing the land I mean, differently than agribusiness does, but still having similar effects of dispossessing people and resources. There were also internal problems about some individuals illicitly chopping down trees in the forest to sell the timber, just to gain income. So this community, the form of the Communidades Traditionais was initiated to try to create unity in a common project around agroforestry as a symbol and create solidarity links within and across those communities. You can see their, their slogan, you know, in defense of traditional territories, and the, the website name is Preserve, uh, Conserve, and Resist. Now, in, in this case, the, the agroforestry, in one sense, is traditional. The forests have been there for a long time and preserved partly through a statutory mandate. But it was further developed with the help of expertise from, from Embrapa, the this, this state agricultural research agency, which mainly has promoted the green revolution technology packages, but has a section with many good staff members also pr promoting agroecological methods, including agroforestry. So from that base of agroforestry, the FCT initiated Turismo de Base Comunitaria, community-based tourism. And this aim to counter the stereotypical form of tourism, which involves harmful real estate development and creates simulations of traditional culture at best and undermines those, those cultures. So they create their own guides, roteros, tourist guides, to explain the, the cultures and nature conservation carried out by these communities and to promote their food products, including the uh, Restaurante Quilombo as a showcase of that food and hosting uh, regular festivals of traditional cult cultures telling stories. And the, the TBC is based on you know, enterprises, but as cooperatives on a uh, cooperative basis and sharing the income among the members uh, even for an egalitarian social basis. And then perhaps the, the, the most significant development of agroforestry comes from Progetto Jusada. Now that's the name of a tree which was being chopped down just for timber even though its fruit has extraordinary health qualities. You may know about the acai fruit, which likewise has such qualities. And that's sold in all restaurants in Brazil and perhaps more widely. This Jusara project, that product was uh, less well known, but has even greater health properties than the acai. So this, this was taken up as an opportunity, getting you know, state f funding to create a whole project for conserving the trees, harvesting the fruit, and developing their own expertise for processing the fruit into juice through their own short food supply chains so that they would gain most of the income rather than being lost to intermediaries. And in the, on the Costa Verde, there are many opportunities for this you know, from the more affluent residents and, and the tourism.
from Proyecto Jusara and other initiatives, the FCT gained, yeah, that was, again, sponsored by Petrobras Socio Ambiental. Here's the, the Jusara tree. Ah, yeah. From those efforts, they won a prize, a national competition for Tecnologia Social, funded by the Bank of Brazil. And now, so, Tecnologia Social is a term going back a long time, ha having a much wider relevance. I mean, it's about technologies or innovations which are easily recoverable with locally available resources, and which sp spread knowledge. I, mean, I, I should have mentioned before, saberes, uh, dialogo de saberes is a key term throughout Latin American agroecological initiatives. And that applies as well to Tecnologia Social, <coughs> which was taken up by the agroecology movement for Tecnologia Socioambiental. Now, that phrase was used by both the MST settlement and the FCT projects, meaning you know, in addition to being um, socially beneficial and easily replicable, it would also conserve national resources and use them in a sustainable way. Now, I can go back. Now, earlier I mentioned external threats. And those threats you know, led the, uh, the FCT network and their supporters to hold protest events against plans for real estate development. In particular, a potential decision to rezone some parts for real estate development because they would need permission to do that under the law. But even worse, there then came a proposal for a constitutional amendment, which would transfer the authority from the local authorities to the federal government, which you know, is overwhelmingly, even, even under the Workers' Party government, those institutions were overwhelmingly pro-agribusiness and, and for you know, resource-intensive tourism development and real estate development and so on. But now even more so, obviously, since the end of the Workers' Party government. So they mounted the protest, especially against the, that proposed constitutional amendment, as well as against the potential rezoning, you know, against that amendment, guarantee our future. So I'll move towards some conclusions now. Going back to the concept Desde movimiento territorial rural. So earlier I contrasted two different versions of the concept. So the antagonistic version, as I call it, you know, better explains the diverse trajectories, multi actor tensions, and potential or actual conflicts that arise. This version provides a basis for identifying territorial conflicts, indeed struggles over the meaning of territory. And we analyze the, those processes through the, the schema of four parameters in the handout. Together, these parameters help to identify sharp differences among the agroforestry cases as well as conflicts within them. So Fazenda de Toque illustrates agroecological practices, really agroecosystems, as in the 
the scientific basis of agroecology, but for niche markets, effectively greening capitalism, you know, through the stereotypical dominant supply chains of food processors and stereotypical division of labor. By contrast, Mario Lago and the FCT illustrate socio-territorial movements confronting the hegemonic system and dep consequently depending more on public policies in order to promote that alternative. So implications of the analysis. So in all these cases, the actors subtly exercise power. They build multi-stakeholder networks. They set agendas, use space, and shape aspirations. Together, these efforts influence other actors, generally in ways overt, avoiding overt conflict. So you can see that even in Fazenda de Toca, they created this effective coalition, including nature conservation organizations, to promote their alternative as environmentally sustainable, which in one sense it is, but it's quite divergent from the agroecology agenda of, of alternatives to the dominant system. And in a different way than you know, um, the other two case studies developed and depended on multi-actor processes to, to gain the political power for using public policy, defending their space, and the economic power to create short food supply chains in order to increase their income. At the same time, divergent territorial trajectories generate novel forms of DTR, thus opening up actors to new interests and perhaps transforming them in the process because they're dealing with these multi-actor networks. So the, the four-parameter schema helps to identify how actors promote specific territorial objectives, thus shaping societal conflicts and alliances for specific development trajectories. Now going back to the schema from two decades ago about scaling, further investigation could identify how each parameter may articulate what we call the vertical scale-up of institutional support measures with the horizontal scale-out or multiplication of agroecological practices. Such analysis would facilitate a strategic reading of territory as a basis for multi-stakeholder strategies to expand agroecology as a collective struggle over territory and as a counter to the hegemonic agri-food system. So I'll conclude there.